Yeah, thank, thank you, Richard, for moving on here. And I had to move to the other platform platform now, to the hop-in platform directly to the backstage. And uh, I'm uh, now happy to welcome our opening keynote speaker. Um, it was exactly one year ago in early September 2020 when I met Audrey Tang at an online event hosted by the Bertelsmann Foundation. And the title was Digital Democracy, What Europe Can Learn from Taiwan. That was the topic for the hour and it was extremely impressive to hear Digital Minister Audrey Tang talk about how Taiwan is trying to constructively engage the population in complex decision-making processes using the latest digital technologies through collaborative meetings. Audrey started programming at the age of eight, attended three kindergartens, six elementary schools, and dropped out of middle school at the age of 14. I don't, I can't tell that my son who is 13, you know. Uh, <laughs> Audrey, Audrey has lived with her parents in Germany and in the United States, and she was worked she has worked for Apple on the Siri voice control system, founded several companies, and continues to write software until today. In 2016, Audrey Tang was appointed to Taiwan's cabinet as a minister without portfolio and is now Taiwan's digital minister. I'm delighted that Audrey has agreed to deliver the opening keynote for our DDTA conference in 2021. Please welcome with me Minister Audrey Tang with the talk Digital Social Innovation. Thanks for joining us, Audrey. Hello, uh, good local time, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and I'm told that I have like 18 minutes uh, TED Talk-ish, uh, but this presentation, as Uli said, is one hour long. So I will skip some slides and I will try to leave some time for the Q&A. Now, digital social innovation in Taiwan means it's everyone's business with everyone's help. And we've boiled down this formula of digital social innovation into three key ideas. And that's fast, that's fair, and fun. And this is what enabled us to counter the pandemic uh, with no lockdowns in the past couple of years. We're down to one local case today uh, and also counter the infodemic, the disinformation crisis with no takedowns. The first part pertains to collective intelligence. You're looking at the PTT, which is Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit. But unlike Reddit, it doesn't have any shareholders or any advertisers. It is a National Taiwan University student pet project governed in an open source fashion, squarely in the digital civic infrastructure space, and for the past 25 years has been one of our most trustworthy radar on emerging situations. So uh, at the end of 2019, when Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan posted that uh, there were, and I quote, seven SARS cases in the Huanan Sifu market, end of quote, it got triaged on PTT almost immediately resulting in, on the first day of 2020, health inspection for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan. And this says two things. First, that people trust the government sufficiently, right? This is a uh, freedom of speech, of assembly environment. And also, the government trusted the people uh, with the newest signals through collective intelligence platforms. Now, for people who are not so used to text posts, maybe the younger generation, the older generation doesn't have the same digital savviness, we also provide like 1922, which is a toll-free number. Anyone can pick up their landline or mobile phone and call this number and share what they want uh, to get answer from the Central Epidemic Command Center or the CECC, which hosts a press conference every 2 p.m. So, for example, last April, there was a young boy that called 192 saying, hey, you're rationing out masks, but all I got was pink ones. And all the boys in my class have navy blue masks, and I don't want to wear pink to school. People will laugh at me. Well, the very next day, all the medical officers, including the uh, Minister Chen Shizhong of Health and Welfare, wore pink. And Minister Chen even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. And suddenly, the boy became the most hit boy in the class, where only he has the color that the heroes wear, and the hero's hero, I guess. Where And so this means that gender mainstreaming is not a top-down thing. It is just from people's real-time input, the signal become something that we can amplify and set new social norms with. 
Another example pertains to the mask rationing. So the team that built the G0V or Gov0 um, community movement for the past, well, it's been 15 years now, um, basically um, proved that people don't have to wait for the government to make digital services. But rather, in the past 10 years or so, in the past decade, whenever people see a digital service that's not done well or missing from the government, instead of waiting for something that GOV from TW uh, to happen, people can just prototype things by themselves and call it something that G0V, the TW. So just by changing uh, O to a zero, you get into the shadow government that's always more fun and open source. And basically it's like a swarm approach where people can try various different ways to realize um, the digital service, but it's always open source. So it means that, for example, um, last February, when uh, a young civic technologist prototyped uh, through G0V, uh, the real-time visualization of mask availability in pharmacies. Well, within three days, uh, we saw that this has really gained popularity. So we did a reverse procurement. Is a civic technologist doing the prototype? And is we, the government, trusting the citizens with real-time open data, which enable more than 100 different tools, including the mapping, chatbots, and so on, to help people to locate the PPEs. And and also uh, made us realize that our previous distribution methods wasn't really fair because people wasn't using the same um, hours of time to travel to the nearby pharmacy and so on. So in light of this data bias, we again adapted uh, to the real numbers and then changed our distribution method to allow for pre-registration and so on within 24 hours after this has been revealed by the civic technologists. Now, of course, uh, real-time data, free from bias, is very good. But also, uh, to make it participatory, we also need to make it fun. And so we call it humor over rumor. As long as the science, the clarification uh, spreads to more people than this information, then we will always get people who want to contribute to, to science. So, for example, when we introduce physical distancing uh, on the top left, uh, we said, this very cute dog is actually the companion animal uh, of the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. We've got around 100 people. Sometimes them themselves are comedians or they work closely with comedians. But anyway, they uh, realize that if they make the uh, scientific literature into memes, so when you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away. When you're outdoor, keep two. Uh, dogs away from each other, uh, or uh, on the bottom right, why would you wear a mask? Wear a mask, protects yourself from your own unwashed hands, explained this very cute dog named Stone Chai. So basically, by uh, translating our scientific literature into this memes, which allows for free remixing and so on, we engage the community to further remix these um, sufficiently humorous information so that uh, when the disinformation about mask use, about vaccine and so on come, well, we can rely on this community participation of people who already understand the basic science. And so this May, uh, when we really had our first wave, uh, the same people who designed these memes and who designed the uh, mask rationing map again banded together to create a checking method called the 1922 checking method. Again, without installing any app, using your phone's um, built-in camera, without even unlocking your iPhone, you can just scan a QR code, send an SMS, and within just a couple of seconds, finish this check-in. And then the QR code simply uh, describes the location code of that particular venue. It's uh, entirely random code, and it says on the text, for epidemic control use only. And so uh, what this means? is that when people do not have a scanner, uh, or if you're using a feature phone, you can always manually type in the 15 digits random code and send manually to 1922. And then after that, it's kept not in the government, but rather in your telecom. So the telecom keeps it only for four weeks, and you can do a reverse uh, check to make sure that all the access from the contact tracers, uh, actually you can see which contact tracer, uh, look at which uh, ch check-in information of yours. And the greater thing about this 
is that it's always self-service. The um, the posters, the use of uh, these QR posters in various venues, uh, such as transportation and um, you know small night market and, and things like that, are all supported by the social sector. That is to say, the same people who build and maintain the PTT, what we call the social sector, uh, provides the. Um, service and assistance to get people to print those QR codes. So we get more than 300 million SMS sent in the first four weeks. And that very successfully reduced our contact tracing from um, hours into, well, minutes. So um, to summarize a little bit, uh, to counter both the pandemic and also the infodemic, we rely on universal, not just healthcare coverage, but also broadband as a human right. Uh, and then we focus on the research and development and universal access so that in our basic education, we, we're not just saying a media literacy or a digital literacy, we're saying media and digital competence. That is to say, middle schoolers can contribute to climate science, to political science, to all sorts of sciences by simply making the memes and participating in the online communities such as Gov Zero. And this is how we fought the infodemic with no takedown and the pandemic with no lockdown. And this corresponds to President Tsai Ing-wen's idea. Um, during her first inauguration speech, she said, before we think of democracy as a showdown between opposing values, but nowadays in the new century, we must think of democracy as a conversation between many diverse values. By the way, this is my, my office, like my real office in the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei City. Anyone can drop by. This is an open space. It's literally a park. Uh, and anyone can request um, 30 to 40 minutes of my time as long as they agree to speak on the record. Indeed, I publish all the conversations with lobbyists and journalists and so on, either as Creative Commons uh, transcripts or as Creative Commons video footages. And this enables this open innovation style where people can talk to me about their latest ideas, but they always uh, make the case based on a pro-social uh, thing, uh, sustainable development, because it will look really bad to the future generations uh, because everything's on the record if they make something that is only good for them and sacrifice future generations. So this is how we make sure that we can co-create the norms on self-driving vehicles through presidential hackathon, on water um, supply uh, repair, uh, and all sorts of data coalitions. And because I don't have time to go through the details, but this uh, a prototype of the mask rationing map was completed a few years ago before the pandemic, uh, also by the GovZero community, so that uh, each middle school uh, student can learn about data competence by maintaining through the, what we call Internet of Things, uh, a PM 2.5 and other uh, sensors on a climate uh, measurement device. And it shares to a distributed ledger so that people can learn about data stewardship, data bias, data controller, and things like that. The, the very abstract notions of GDPR suddenly became uh, very easy to understand because they participate in climate science uh, by measuring the things and sharing with the world on how they're measuring it and contributing to the climate. And every year, uh, we use a new voting method called quadratic voting uh, to surface the top 10 and then top five uh, social innovations in the past year. Uh, and the president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, gave them this trophy and promised whatever they did on a smaller scale will make it uh, into national scale infrastructure, like a digital public infrastructure within the next year, just like if it's a presidential promise. So basically we scale uh, the social sector's ideas into the public sector and then the private sector collaborates with the norms that's already ratified by this partnership. So I call this a people-public-private partnership. And we go into the rural areas, the small towns, and so on, to surface the local social innovations and, of course, use digital to connect them into the sandbox experiments. Now, this time-limited experiments, which may be three months, as in the presidential hackathon, or six months, or a year, after we uh, gave them this license to experiment, we must decide whether this is a good idea or not. Just like in 2015, uh, when Uber X first started operating in Taiwan, we used the same method. Uh, Polis is a free software uh, visualization tool, a assistive intelligence powered conversation where people can see this is my real like friends and families and how they feel about Uber X at the time. 
So um, by publishing the fox as open data and using this online deliberative space to only collect people's feelings, we dedicate uh, three to four weeks of time to these feelings. And when feelings resonate with one another, then we can call these ideas good enough consensus or rough consensus and ratify them into law. And so, for example, on the UberX case, I would say, oh, I think passenger liability is very important. And if you agree with me, you move toward me. And if you don't agree with me, well, you move farther away from me. But after three weeks, everyone can see, pretty much everyone agree with all your neighbors on all the points all the time. And the abstract ideological statements like whether it is a sharing economy or gig economy well we agree to disagree that we spend far more calories on the consensus statements which then get swiftly translated into new measurements of progress and then into the decisions that is to say the regulations and laws and this is how we can bring those different positions into shared values and into social innovations. So that's my talk. Uh, and I would like to share with you my job description uh, to, to wrap up this talk. So five years ago when I became digital minister, I said, okay, my job is just uh, target 1717, 1718, 176. There's effective partnership, reliable data and open innovation. But the HR department said, no, you have to write in plain language. And so I translated that uh, into a poem, I guess, which goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, big applause from my side. And if you can't hear it, there is a lot of applause for sure from the auditorium. Um, and especially for your very nice ending poem, which uh, kind, kind of resonates very well in the design thinking mind minds uh, who are gathering here globally, uh, because we are for sure focusing on diversity we are for sure focusing on plurality and uh, not singularity i think that is a, a big a big issue and uh, yeah thank thanks a lot i'm not sure how we how we are ah, i see here now the the questions uh we we got um actually um so there's a question from romania from raluca i would like to know how to how you made IT people and people, how you made, how you made IT people and people that could code to use the Gov uh, platform, right? Um, so, uh, so the government technologists, the GovTech people, right, and the civic technologists, the civic tech people, uh, how do I connect them? Is that a question? I think she was. Uh, I think the question goes into the direction. Uh, IT people might might get easy access, but how do you get the people who are not able to code also to oh, okay. Okay. Uh, to um, adapt yeah. to those platforms? Right. Uh, for, first of all, the idea of digital public infrastructure, like any public infrastructure, is that we adapt to the people, to the society. We're not asking the people to adapt to us. So, for example, the town hall meetings that I just showed you to deliberate into those police conversations. Well, it's me who goes around Taiwan on those tours. I'm not asking people on the rural and remote area indigenous nation to come to the capital city of Taipei. And so this means that well, when, whenever we're designing uh, things, we're not designing for people, we're designing with people. And this is only possible because people see that uh, it's as easy as uh, picking up a phone and call 1922 and say you should do this better. It's as easy as set up a local like literally town hall and then being supported uh, by the video conferencing uh, tools uh, provided by the local digital opportunity center so they can connect uh, to the 
other municipalities. It's also uh, because they wouldn't spend an extra dime in any place in Taiwan, even top of Taiwan, which is almost 4,000 meters high, you're guaranteed to get 10 megabits per second broadband for just 16 euros a month. If you don't, it's my fault, like personally, my fault. And so because of that, it costs almost nothing uh, to transmit this conversation locally into a national scale. Hmm. There's another question from Sherif. Uh, you're saying, I'm very inspired, uh, but also very curious to know how the governmental mindset uh, there was shifted to promote or embrace this in the first place. Uh, when was the turning point and uh, what were the strategies? It's actually a, a very good question. I'm asking myself also looking at Germany, uh, what, where is the turning point and what, what do we have to, where is the trigger? Yeah, um, so in Taiwan's case, the trigger uh, was in 2014 March when we occupied a parliament building uh, in demonstration uh, against a um, trade agreement with Beijing at a time which wasn't being deliberated substantially by the people. Uh, and so 20 or so NGOs each occupied one side of the parliament. And for example, one aspect talked about whether we want to allow 5G components at a time, 4G components from the Beijing regime's uh, so-called market players into our uh, telecom infrastructure. Now, that was in 2014. Nowadays, everybody else is talking about this as well. But uh, when we did that, um, we did not have many other countries talking about this issue. So we have to handle the deliberation on the street as well as online. Uh, so with half a million people on the street and many more online, after three weeks of nonviolent demonstration, we actually ended up on some very concrete consensus, which was then adopted adopted by the head of the parliament. So the Occupy was a success and the demonstration was not really a protest, it was a demo, a demonstration in a software sense, right? a brief that's turned into a minimal proof of concept. And after that, in the end of 2014, all the mayors that supported uh, open government uh, gets elected or re-elected and um, all the mayoral candidate that didn't, well, or didn't, sometimes surprisingly. And so after that, the entire kind of political culture in Taiwan shifted to uh, um, the four parties at the moment at the parliament, they are all competing, but they're competing to be more transparent and participatory. Wow. That gives me hope that there is also a chance in other countries to do that. Definitely. But I have an additional question from, from my side, actually. So uh, if I look at the population here in, in Germany and also the, the, the kind of not being mm -hmm. from a political side uh, digitally enough through the past 20 years, well, there, there is still, there was still the saying some years ago by our chancellor that uh, digitalization is Neuland, is new territory. And that was, for me, that is 30 years ago, that was new territory, but, but for a lot of people, it is still. So is uh, there the kind of digital education in Taiwan, is that way more advanced than in other countries from your perspective, since we have lived in, in Germany for a while and in the United States? You, you might be able to compare. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that's because we prioritize the use of open source and open hardware, open API, in especially our basic education curriculum, so that the students learn to um, make things, that is to say, Instead of just saying, you know, uh, you need to be literate, uh, literate, meaning that when a large company designs something, you can operate it. Uh, we say you, you need to be competent, meaning that you can design your own air boxes or you can fact check the presidential uh, debate and forum in real time, uh, working with mainstream media. People actually did that and uh, things like that. So even if you are under 18 in Taiwan, you are strongly encouraged by your civics class teacher and really any teacher uh, that you can make a real difference. Uh, for example, in our national petition platform, more than one quarter of the successful petitions were raised by people under 18, uh, like banning plastic straws from our national identity drink, the bubble tea, uh, that was raised by 17 years old and so on. So with some real cases, people understand they can make things happen even before they turn 18. Oh, yeah. There's a question from Min. Uh, who is the primary contact person in Taiwan if the internet connection gets worse or interrupted? 
Hmm. Well, that would be TW Nick, I, I believe, <laughs> on a telecom level. Uh, but for example, when uh, the Yangming Mountain, uh, that's a, a mountain near Taipei City, uh, there was a place being purposed into a managed isolation center. And I got an email saying, uh, Minister, you promised Robin is human right. I'm being quarantined. I just went back home in Taiwan uh, for 14 um, days. But uh, on that side of Yangming Mountain, we don't get signal from any of the five telecoms. I'm suffering from a lack of human right. I'm being abused. My human right is in danger. <laughs> and so after two weeks, we set up a new telecom tower uh, near the Yangming Mountain uh, to provide streaming service. And of course, by that time, that person is already out of quarantine, but he made a point of driving back, measuring the, the speed uh, and posting on social media. So that's the level of our commitment. <laughs> Very good. There's a question from Juliana uh, Proserpio. I think she is now in Australia or in Brazil. I know her from, from Brazil. Audrey, mm -hmm. could you share a bit about the org organizational design of your ministry? Also, how, how do you deploy the policy turned into use technology and then be embraced by the citizens? Yeah, um, well, you can check out my website at digitalministry.tw, which explains some of it. But the main idea, very simple, is that my office uh, has one secondment at most from each other ministries. So I've got like 12 different secondments from 12 different ministries. So the idea is that there's no rank. Uh, maybe one secondment was a section uh, chief. Another was a deputy director. So if they come from the same ministry, only the more higher rank will have um, decisional power, of course. But because they belong to very different ministries, so that means that they have equal contribution to this horizontal leadership team. And the other half of my office um, came I think the initial co-founder came uh, from the uh, CIID, the Copenhagen uh, Interaction Design. Uh, another came from Policy Lab and previously our CAA uh, Service Design, uh, our current design lead from IDEO, uh, and so on. So it's these um, secondments uh, from the areas that doesn't have a corresponding ministry. We don't have a ministry for design. <laughs> so we need uh, contributors from these expertise areas. But each new hire uh, must offer a new perspective a new discipline and also they need to contribute as well as they take into their previous communities and so by maximizing diversity we make sure that whatever we design is a uh, Pareto improvement that is to say it leaves no one behind it's safer and also swift for everyone in involved yeah there's a question there are lots of questions here but I just pick some some of the uh, there's one relating to what you're just saying that the uh, mean is also asking or saying the most European ministries are spending most of the time for paperwork. How many hours do you do daily in paperwork? I don't. <laughs> I don't do paper. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm Taiwan's first tele commuting minister. So I had three working conditions entering the cabinet. First, wherever I'm working, I'm working, I'm telecommuting. Second, I don't give orders to other ministries and I don't take orders from other ministries either. So I'm a minister at large. And finally, it's by um, the idea is radical transparency. That is to say, if I work with these ministries on this particular project, the entire um, the entire process is accountable because you can look it up uh, on our transcript platform to date. Uh, there's more than uh, 6,500 6, people in more than 300,000 speeches and you can see each and every one one uh, of these utterances. So uh, it is not paperwork because as we're having this conversation, for example, um, some assistive intelligence may just transcribe this meeting and then we can publish it and under the Creative Commons. And the great thing about this is that people can just take it and make decisions by themselves. They don't have to get my approval. So because I don't do approvals, uh, I don't do paperwork either. Yeah. We have just two minutes to go, and there is uh, there are several questions uh, also around um, uh, all around the the, uh, the question or uh, the issue of trust. And mm -hmm. uh, here's one: Why do you think the people of Taiwan trust the government so much, and why is it that the people of Taiwan are so open mm -hmm. to innovation? Well, to give no trust is to get no trust. 
So, for example, when we introduce this digital counter uh, epidemic efforts, well, we may have a approval rate of 91%, for example, uh, but we thank those 9% because these are the people who will call 1922, uh, who will write blog articles and so on, which will result in the public hearings in the parliament because we've never declared a state of emergency. Each and everything we do must be answerable to the members of the parliament. And so after we, for example, detail this entire uh, way of how our digital counter pandemic efforts work, we look back uh, into the poll numbers and then 94% um, of people trust us, 3% more. And we, then we thank the 6%. Uh, and when whenever they raise new issues and so on, we just make sure that we respond on the next day's uh, 2 p.m. press conference. And so this basically means that if the government maximally trusts the citizens, some citizens may trust back. And that's what guided the innovations into truly social innovations, because none of the ideas that I just share with you is my idea. All of it came from the social sector, from the civil society. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, even if it's just 10 o'clock, one, I have to ask one, one last question, uh, which is regarding the education system. I was so impressed to hear that you kind of redesigned, or you were involved also in the redesign of the education system mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Uh, I think it was two years ago already. Uh, what I what what do you see is the most important thing to change in education as your last statement here today? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly. So um, I believe just as when I said, whenever we think uh, that a singularity may be near, whenever we hear that, we must always remember the plurality is here. So the role of we policymakers and teachers in general is not to get give perfect answers is not to give so-called perfect correct answers but rather to be good enough ancestors good enough ancestorship means that uh, we tell the people uh, what we have but if our next generations have a better idea then we always let them guide us and we just provide a resource to their new directions thank you very much and uh, thank you very much audrey for being our opening keynote speaker here today and sharing your ideas and visions to the whole global design thinking community. Uh, we are very happy that you're here. Thanks a lot and uh, greetings to Taiwan. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye. Bye bye.